And now the news has spread that the Prophet ﷺ is about to arrive. And so every single day, the Ansar would go outside of the city towards what is now Quba, waiting for the Prophet ﷺ to come. And so one day they went in the morning waiting and nothing happened. And they came back by 10, 11 o'clock. And in the distance, the Prophet and Abu Bakr appeared, but there were no Ansar there because they were already back home in their houses. And it is said that he entered the city of Medina on a Friday. And it so happened that one of the, the Jewish men was on the top of the tree plucking the dates. So he was the first to see in the distance the Prophet and Abu Bakr coming. So the Jews, the Jew became so happy, he cried out at the top of his lungs that, Oh Arabs, your king has arrived. When the news spread, the Ansar rushed out in hordes, hundreds and hundreds of them. And the Prophet entered, according to one report, on the 2nd of Rabi'ul Awwal, according to another, on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, in the 14th year of the Da'wah, which was to become the first year of the Hijrah. And Al Bara ibn Azim narrates in Sahih Muslim that I saw the Ansar all dressed up coming out and over 500 men came outside all of them armed meaning to as a welcoming committee and they accompanied the Prophet you know the famous story that we are all told that the little girls were singing right this story for sure it did not happen at the Hijrah the women climbed up onto the houses. The children are thronging around to see. And the Prophet is surrounded by literally hundreds, if not thousands of people, all of whom believe in him, all of whom are happy that he is coming. And for the first time, we get a glimmer of hope. Change is in the air. We can sense that a new tide is coming, that the change has begun, that the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will signal a new era. And this is the seed of the first Islamic nation. Here is also the famous story, which is inshallah ta'ala an authentic one, that every one of the Sahaba of Ansar was trying to ask the Prophet to stay with them. And the Prophet said, let the camel go where it is going because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken charge of it. And the camel sat down at a particular place and the Prophet understood this was the place that Allah had decided will be his masjid. When the camel sat down, the Prophet said, whose house of our family members is the closest to us from here? Remember the Prophet ﷺ had distant cousins in Medina. His great-grandmother is Madanese. Here is where Khalid ibn Zayd, also known as Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I am the closest in lineage to you, basically from your camel. My house is the closest to this area. Roughly, he's like a sixth cousin to the Prophet ﷺ, right? Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, we only have a few narrations about him in his house. The Prophet ﷺ lived there, according to Ibn Sa'id, for half a year. And he did this because he didn't have a house to live in, obviously. And he's waiting waiting for the masjid and the house to be built. Abu Ayyub's house also had two stories in it. And so Abu Ayyub and his wife moved upstairs and the Prophet and Abu Bakr uh, were living downstairs. Ibn Hisham mentions a story that occurred one night that in the middle of the night, Abu Ayyub turned over in his sleep and he knocked over the water bottle. And he became worried that the water would seep from the second floor basically and drip onto the Prophet as he was sleeping. And so he woke his wife up and the two of them, they spent the entire night soaking their own blanket with the water, making sure, and yani dreading basically that maybe one drop of water would possibly irritate the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, it is also narrated in a hadith in Musa Imam Ahmed that one day Abu Ayyub was with his wife upstairs and then Fantabaha. He realized and he said to his wife, we are walking above the head of the Prophet ﷺ. And he realized this in the evening. And so him and his wife spent the night cramped next to the sides now. So they sit with their feet withdrawn in for the entire night. And the next morning, they go back down to the Prophet ﷺ and they say, Ya Rasulullah, you have to move up. The Prophet ﷺ said, the bottom floor is easier for me. Abu Ayyub said, La Wallahi Ya Rasulullah, we can never ever be on top of you on a roof that your head is over. So they amazingly disobeyed him out of respect, if that's possible. And so the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr then for the bulk of their time actually moved upstairs. It is also narrated that one time Abu Ayyub he would always cook the food him and his wife and they would send it up to the Prophet ﷺ. Then he would eat the leftovers. Abu Ayyub would ask, where did the Prophet ﷺ eat from? Which place of the plate? And wherever he ate from, he would eat from that particular portion he would eat from it. One day the food came down untouched. Abu Ayyub panicked. And he rushed upstairs and he said, Ya Rasulullah, what have I done? What is wrong? Is there anything that, you know, the food was not suiting you? What happened? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, but it has garlic in it. Abu Ayyub said, is garlic haram? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, but I speak to those whom you don't speak to, which means the angels. This is uncooked garlic. If you put it in the food, then it will have a very bad after smell. 
Getting back to the story of the masjid itself. As we said, the camel sat down in a small area of land. The Prophet said, who does this land belong to? They said that it belongs to so and so and so and so. They are orphans. Their father owned the land. Now they have inherited this land. So the Prophet said, call them here. We're going to build a masjid here. So we need this land. According to one narration, their names were Sahal and Suhail. When the orphans came and they figured out what the Prophet was doing, they were already Muslims. They said, Ya Rasulullah, this is a gift to Allah from us. The Prophet said, no. I will only take it with his due price. And he negotiated a price with them and he paid them the money to purchase the land from them. And he ordered that the few date palms that were there, there were probably less than a dozen. He ordered that they all be cut down and he used those very trees to form the walls of the masjid. Talk about being green and conservation. The front and the back walls were made with those trees and the side walls were made with the clay bricks that they had in Medina at the time. And there were one or two graves from very old still over there he ordered that those corpses be buried outside and the Prophet participated along with them in the construction of the masjid there was a whole line going the Sira book say from the quarry to the masjid and the Prophet became a part of that line and when one of the Sahaba tried to make him sit down and work and do the work the Prophet refused and cooperated with them when the Sahaba saw him they said wallahi if we sit down and the Prophet is working then this from us is a very astray matter this is a very shameful and misguided thing from us. And it is said that the Prophet began saying lines of poetry at the time, along with the Ansar and the Muhajirun. Allahumma inna la khaira illa khaira al -akhira. Oh Allah, there is no good other than the good of the Akhirah. Farham al Ansara wal Muhajira. So have mercy on the Ansar and the Muhajira. One incident is narrated here, and that relates to Ammar ibn Yasir. And he is carrying two large bricks, and his entire body has been dusted cover to cover. And he says, and in my opinion, this is like a joking thing to say in that he didn't mean it seriously. He said, Ya Rasulullah, they're killing me by giving me two stones and they're taking only one. So what did the Prophet do? He smiled and he brushed the dust off of him. And he said, No, O son of Sumayyah, they are not killing you. Rather, the people who shall kill you will be Al-Fi'atul Baghiyah. Al-Fi'atul Baghiyah means the group that has gone beyond the bounds. And he also said to him, everybody's getting one reward when they carry their stones you're getting two rewards with your two stones. And he said to him, the last thing you shall drink in this world will be a glass of milk. Right? SubhanAllah, he predicted the death of Ammar ibn Yasir. It is well known that Ammar was drinking some milk and then he went to fight in the battle and he died. So this hadith was said at the building of the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu And it is narrated in Al-Bayhaqi's Dala'il that it took almost two weeks to build the masjid. And for its time, it was extremely large. And Allahu A'lam, but some modern estimates have said around 100 by 130 feet. Also, we learned that there were at least three main doors. One on the south side, that's the Bab al rahma One on the west side, that's called Bab Jibreel. And one on the east side, and that is called Bab al nisa And the reason why it's called Bab al nisa is that a few years later, Umar ibn al-Khattab suggested that men and women should not enter with the same door. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, that east door is the door for women. In addition to these three main entrances, there were also a number of small entrances that were private entrances. These were the three public ones. There were at least half a dozen private. Realize in those days, the walls were such a luxury item that people would use the same wall for both sides, right? So if you build a wall here, the other side would automatically be taken by a house. And so whoever is living on the other side of the wall would have direct access to the masjid. So we know for a fact that Abu Bakr was one of those whose house was attached to the masjid. Because on his deathbed, the Prophet ﷺ said, every single door of these private doors shall be locked and sealed from now on, except the door of Abu Bakr. And of course, the main one that we know of for sure is the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha, right? Aisha's house was literally attached to the masjid such that the only thing separating it was a curtain. And this was a private entrance. The house had a public entrance on the other side. We also know from one narration from Hassan al-Basri that the roof of the masjid was actually very low. That if he put his hand up, he could feel the roof of the masjid. We also know that initially the Prophet ﷺ only covered one area of the masjid with a roof. So at one time, the front portion of the masjid was 
covered by thatched palm leaves. Towards the middle of the Madani period, we don't know exactly when, the Prophet ﷺ ordered that a roof be built over the whole masjid. And of course, the blessings of the masjid are well known. It is one of the three sacred masjids in Islam, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. These are the only three sacred lands in our religion, by the way, that one should travel to. We all know as well that a prayer in Masjid al-Nabawi is equal to a thousand prayers anywhere else. We also know that the Prophet ﷺ said, what is between my house and my mimbar is, between, is one of the rawda. Rawda means a lush garden. Rawda to miryad al-jannah. Scholars have differed what does this mean. One interpretation is that that very land will be transferred to jannah. A more common interpretation is worshipping Allah on that land will get you to jannah. We know that in the early portion of the Medinan period, one of the stumps of the tree, the Prophet ﷺ used it for his mimbar. In one hadith in Bukhari, it is said, he even prayed his salah on the stump to show the Ansar how to pray. Until he had to do sajda, then he cannot do sajda. So then he stepped down, he did sajda, and then he went back up onto the stump. So for a few years, he would give the khutbah on this stump. Remember the trees were cut down, one of those trees was used as his mimbar. Then in Sahih Muslim, we learn, that one time the Prophet ﷺ told one of the Ansari ladies there who had a slave who was a carpenter, tell your carpenter to make for me a mimbar. And so the carpenter made a mimbar of three steps. The three steps were placed away from the, the trunk, basically. So the trunk obviously is there and the three steps are over here. During the first khutbah on those three steps, the Sahaba said, we began to hear a wailing, a crying, like that of a baby camel. And we found that the source of this noise was the tree, the stump. And the Prophet ﷺ interrupted his khutbah and came down and hugged the tree, subhanAllah. And it sniffled and stopped crying. Basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us or the Sahaba to hear the emotions of the tree. Anas ibn Malik reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, if I didn't hug it, it would have cried until the day of judgment. And he ordered that the tree that been then be uplifted and uprooted and then dug underneath his actual mimbar so that it's still over there. Obviously, the tree is jealous. So the Prophet gave the tree its wish by putting it under the mimbar. And at this, Al Hassan al Basri said, O oh believers, look, this was a tree that was crying because it wished to be with the Prophet ﷺ. Is it not more befitting that those of us who are men should cry even more to be with him? The Prophet ﷺ did not even build his own house until the house of Allah was built. This is just mind-boggling, wallahi, to think about. And because of this, he did not live with his family. He's living with Abu Bakr. We see, therefore, the importance of the masjid. The masjid even before his house, sallallahu The masjid was the place of ilm. This is where halaqat would be given. The masjid was the place of shura. This is where the Prophet called the Sahaba in the Battle of Badr, in the Battle of Uhud. He's calling them, what do you think we should do? It's basically the constitution place as well. It's the place where people come together and decide affairs. The masjid is social. Socialization. The people would socialize over there. The Prophet would ask them about their days of jahiliyyah and they would laugh and joke inside the masjid. The masjid was a place of celebration. Their nikahs would take place in the masjid. From it, even the armies of Islam spread because they would be arranged inside the masjid. And then they would go out from there. And in it, those who had no house would sleep. SubhanAllah, the Prophet was in his masjid more than he was in his own house. One thing that we don't know exactly when is the changing of the raka'at of the five salawat. Now, when were the five salawat? decreed we all know Isra wal Mi'raj so people are praying five times a day however at that time every single one of those five was two rakat sometime early on the Sahaba the Prophet started praying as we now know it right two four four three four we also know that within the first month or two the question arose how was the time for prayer to be given the Prophet called the Sahaba and they said and he asked them how should we call the people at the time of the salah what is your idea and so they started discussing what should be done? One of them said, let us use a bell like the Christians. But this was discarded. Others said, let us use a chauffeur. Not a chauffeur, car chauffeur. A chauffeur is what the Yehud use, right? It's a horn. They call it a chauffeur. But also this was discarded. And others gave other ideas, but no idea basically made sense. So the meeting finished without any idea being chosen. That night, two people saw a dream. One of them was Umar ibn al-Khattab. The other was Abdullah ibn Zayd. And their dreams were the same. That Abdullah ibn Zayd saw in his dream a man selling some items, either the horn or the bell or something. So he went up to him and said, can I buy these items? So the man said, why? 
So he said, because the Prophet wants to tell us how to call the people to prayer, so I'm thinking one of these will do the job. So the man said, should I not tell you something better than that? So the Sahabi said, of course. Abdullah bin Zayn said, of course. So he said, when you want to give the time for prayer, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu. And then all the way to the end of the Adhan, right? And then he woke up and the dream was so vivid in his head, he just put on his garments and rushed outside to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is the dream that I saw. And he told him the entire dream. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is a true dream. Stand up, O Bilal, because you have the loudest voice. And Abdullah bin Zayd, go up with him to the roof of the masjid and tell him every phrase and he'll repeat after you. And so Abdullah bin Zayd said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And Bilal repeated in a loud voice, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And so technically Abdullah bin Zayd did give the first adhan but except it was to uh, Bilal but then Bilal is the one who proclaims it to the entire world and as he's giving the adhan Umar comes rushing into the masjid without having fully tied his lower garment right and he says Ya Rasulullah I saw these phrases in the dream so Allah Azza had shown it to multiple of the Sahaba and Allah had willed that Abdullah bin Zayd was the one who be the one who get the honor of telling it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we already said that the Prophet Sallallahu built the masjid in around two to three weeks. And then after this, he built his houses. He had two wives at this time, Sauda and Aisha. And so Sauda and Aisha's houses were built next to the masjid. These were the only two houses that were connected to the masjid. And he married other women later on by a number of years. And by that time, people had already moved in and connected other houses to the masjid. So the Prophet's other wives' houses were in a separate block. Now, at this stage, hijrah was obligatory on every individual Muslim, down to women and children, to emigrate from Mecca and come to Medina. Except for those who are genuinely weak of the men, women, and children, but they cannot find a way out, nor can they find a passage to get to Medina. For these people, they will be forgiven. The ruling of hijrah from Mecca to Medina, it was fardain for the Muslims of that time. And then after the conquest of Mecca, this ruling was abrogated. And so the Prophet said, Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no hijrah after the conquest of Mecca. Is it permissible for Muslims to voluntarily and willingly live in a land that is not a land of Islam? Hanafi and the Hanbali opinion and also the standard Shafi'i opinion is that it is permissible for a Muslim to live in lands that are not Darul Islam with some basic conditions. And of these conditions is that the Muslim is secure in his religion. He's not being tortured. He's not being forced to do haram and he can live an Islamic life. And they base this on an authentic hadith, which is as explicit as possible. So this is also my position as well. It is a hadith of the Sahabi known as Fudayk. Towards the end of the process of his life, after the conquest of Mecca, Fudayk came to Medina. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, the people are saying that whoever does not do hijrah will be destroyed. And in one version he said, my people are upon shirk. My tribe has not yet all accepted Islam, but I'm a Muslim. And so I have been told that I have to make hijrah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Fudayk, establish the salah and avoid the sins and live with your people wherever you like. This hadith is reported in Ibn Hibban's Sahih. How did the early emigrants, how did the Muhajirun find the environment? How did they like Medina? The early Muhajirun did not like Medina because there is truly no place like home. And so the Prophet ﷺ made a special dua for all of the Muhajirun. Oh Allah, make Medina beloved to us like we used to love Mecca or even more than we used to love Mecca. Oh Allah, bless us in our food measurements, meaning all of the food supplies of Medina, right? Oh Allah, take the bad weather and the bad diseases and plagues and throw it outside of Medina in the barren land of Juhfa. And of course Allah answered that dua and therefore the Sahaba began loving Medina even more than they used to love Mecca.